Today's video is brought to you by Bespoke Post. So guys, today we're gonna be talking about the Elder Wand for the 400th time, because apparently there's no shortage of different ways we can analyze this really weird piece of plot device. It's amazing how many different ways it makes sense. It's amazing how many different ways it makes sense. But I think today may, may be the most the essentiest. Hey, brother! Guys, according to legend, the Elder Wand must win all duels for its master, and yet, it keeps changing hands. Like this. Drum squad. What was it called? Drum line. Drum line, not the drum squad. Also, I can't do it anyway, so. But seriously, how do, Elder Wand? How do? Check it out, it's my new wand. It's unbeatable. Wow, that is so awesome. Then how'd you get it? It's a thrilling tale. I beat the last guy who had it. But, but doesn't that, well, um, well, Hmm. The common belief is that the wielder of the Elder Wand cannot lose a duel, specifically because they are the master of the Elder Wand. But this does not seem to deter anyone from coveting it, seeking it, or choosing to try to be the master of it. And yet, the important detail to keep in mind here is that it is not the wizard who chooses the wand, but rather... The wand chooses the wizard, Mr. Potter. So, perhaps the reason why the wielder of the Elder Wand always wins is not because it is giving the wizard even more power, but because the wand itself is actually choosing the more powerful wizard. Before we dive on in, we need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post provides a quality service. Once a month, they send you a box of awesome. My latest box was simple, but immensely useful. It was called Jam and features a Bluetooth speaker that can go with you anywhere. This thing is actually seriously awesome and I was blown away with how much it can fill a room with sound. Or better yet, an alleyway. But in case that's not your jam, Pause for comedic effect. They have loads of other awesome boxes to pick from every single month. And if you're just not feeling any of them, it's super easy to just skip a month. Personally, next month I am torn between two different boxes. The first one is called Frontier and comes with a super cool journal, pen, and a folding knife. And another box called Puffed. Basically just a nice puffy jacket because cold weather is right around the corner. And this is a daily staple that you could wear all the time. The boxes cost $45 each and come packed with over $70 worth of gear and really it does give you something fun to look forward to every single month or else makes a really good gift for someone who's hard to shop for. So if you want to get 20% off your first box, you can do so by going to boxofawesome.com and use promo code super at checkout. Again, that is 20% off your first box when you go to boxofawesome.com slash super. Link is in the description down below. Check it out. By the way, before we begin, special thank you to Satch from our Discord server for submitting this idea. Okay, so let's go ahead and start by breaking down both the wood and core of the Elder Wand. The wood, of course, is elder, and the core is a Thestral hair. The tricky thing we have to deal with right out of the gate is that over on Pottermore, we're only really given information on three different wand cores, that being unicorn hair, dragon heartstring, and phoenix feather. That being said, though, we're not left completely in the dark because we do have the description of the unicorn hair. And if anything is more the opposite of a Thestral, it's a unicorn. Fully grown unicorns shine so bright white that they can actually make freshly fallen snow actually seem gray. So they are incredibly visible, while Thestrals, on the other hand, are quite literally invisible until you've actually witnessed death. And even if you have witnessed death, their actual colors are completely black. So still the opposite of a unicorn. Although speaking of witnessing death, unicorns are still the opposite kind of in that regard, given that their blood will actually keep you from death, even if you are an inch from it. The other thing you'll notice if you can in fact see a Thestral is that they have very large wings, which they can use to travel very fast. Harry even describes it as the fastest he's ever flown, despite literally owning the fastest broomstick on the market. And while unicorns can't fly, they are still just as speedy on the ground. Hagrid explains to Harry that they can actually outstrip a werewolf. Which really, when you think about it, is kind of one of those lines that doesn't totally make sense. Like werewolves aren't just like out there wandering about in the Forbidden Forest all the time. They're humans 99% of the time. Like they're only really dangerous eight hours a month. Not really the point though. The point is that Thestrals and unicorns 
wands are basically opposites. And if you take the characteristics of a unicorn core wand and interpret them the opposite way, it is basically describing the elder wand. This is what Pottermore has to say. Unicorn hair generally produces the most consistent magic and is least subject to fluctuations and blockages. Wands with unicorn cores are generally the most difficult to turn to the dark arts. The fact about the dark arts right away is something that really stands out to me because both Grindelwald and Voldemort use the Elder Wand to perform the dark arts. And I hear you, you might be like, uh, Ben, Voldemort wasn't actually the master of the Elder Wand, but you know what? He sort of is according to, you know, just wait, it'll make sense. The description goes on. They're the most faithful of all wands and usually remain strongly attached to their first owner, irrespective of whether he or she was an accomplished witch or wizard. This one is laughable. The Elder Wand is famously unfaithful, especially towards its first owner. It has changed hands many times and certainly not irrespective of whether or not they were an accomplished witch or wizard because that is literally the defining characteristic that determines who possesses it. Also from Pottermore on unicorn core wands, minor disadvantages of unicorn hair are that they do not make the most powerful wands. I mean, do I really need to explain that one? They are also prone to melancholy if seriously mishandled, meaning that the hair may die and need replacing. The hair may literally die, like this is the exact opposite of the Elder Wand as well. Not that, you know, Thestrals themselves are actually immortal or anything like that, but this wand has been around for a very long time and is very much alive and even being described as sentient by the author who says, the secret of the Elder Wand is that it's more sentient than any other. It can identify the caster of any spell that touches it and keeps tally of which wizard has beaten which, giving its allegiance to the one it judges the victor. Physical possession is irrelevant. So that's the core. Now let's assess the wood. Elder. It contains powerful magic, but scorns to remain with any owner who is not the superior of his or her company. It takes a remarkable wizard to keep the Elder Wand for any length of time. The key takeaway here is that Elder Wood Wands are seeking more powerful owners, and Thestral Hair Cores, if our interpretation is correct, do care about how powerful their owner is. And neither is faithful or easy to keep tame for periods of time. So this theory is suggesting that the power of this wand doesn't come from the magical properties it possesses, but rather the power of its reputation. Here's the big secret. The Elder Wand isn't actually any more powerful than any other wand. That is, until it is possessed by the true master of death. Harry Potter. It's like this. Legend gets out that death himself creates the most powerful wand ever that must win duels for its master. This is what people believe, but the reality is what people think doesn't matter. All that matters is what the wand wants. And the wand being of Thestral and Elder wants to be used by the most powerful wizard. But because people believe that the wand itself is more powerful, powerful wizards seek it out. And then once they have it, the wand's reputation continues to grow because once again, the most powerful wizard possesses it. That is until they meet a more powerful wizard. Do you see the genius of it? It keeps building on itself. What the wand is good at is immediately determining the power levels, if you will, of the two wizards in the duel. And here is where its behavior actually strays from legend. It will not win the duel of whichever wizard possesses it, but it will choose the more powerful wizard. And so this skill that it possesses along with its reputation and desire for the most powerful witches and wizards to possess it creates a kind of parasitic cycle. It's a lot like the game of war with a deck of cards. The game is really simple. Basically, you randomly place down the top card on your deck against somebody else and the high card wins and gets to take all of the cards and you keep playing until one player possesses the whole deck. So imagine you have a wizard at a power level of seven with the Elder Wand and he's fighting a wizard at power level eight. Despite having the wand, the seven will lose because the wand will immediately recognize the eight is more powerful and sabotage its owner. But so it begs the question, if the eight won the duel with without the power of the wand, why would he take it anyway? And that's simple. 
because of its reputation. And so the cycle would continue with each successive owner being that much more powerful than its former. And at that same rate, every time it finds a more powerful companion, the pool of potential new companions dwindles. That is until eventually with enough patience, the wand finds its way to the actual true most powerful wizard, which in the opinion of the elder wand is the true master of death. So going back to our example of the card game of war, the elder wand is anxiously awaiting that perfect ace, the master of death, except in this particular circumstance, there are way more than 52 cards and only one ace and it's possible he hasn't been born yet. I keep telling you, patience is a virtue. These war rules, if you will, can also help us explain why the possession of the wand seems to matter in some instances and not in others. For example, let's go back to our level eight wizard. Imagine some sneaky level six manages to steal the wand away one night and turns around to use it on the eight. I cannot be defeated. I have the elder wand. Foolish boy, I am the wand's master. It will never work for you. And so they duel and of course the eight appears to be right. Despite Despite not physically possessing the wand during the specific battle, the wand recognizes that the eight is in fact more powerful and therefore pledges his allegiance to him. Conversely, if the six that had stolen the wand had just turned around and fought other fives and fours, then it would have continued to work for him. Does that make sense? Like the fact that he possessed it against the fours and fives does make it matter, but not against the eight because the eight was more powerful. And of course you might be thinking if he's a six and he was fighting fours and fives, couldn't he have just beaten them anyway, like without the aid of the Elder Wand? And the answer is yes, he could have. That is exactly my point. The only one actually winning when this wand changes hands is the wand. So that is our theory. So let's apply it to the story and see if it holds up. We'll track it as best as we can with what we know about the current path of the Elder Wand. First, we know that Grindelwald steals it from Grigorovich. Does he overpower or defeat him? No, but he does go on to continue to possess and be the master of it for 20 something years. This would be like if the queen broke in and stole the wand from an eight. The eight could be like, I never actually lost the duel the wand still belongs to me, but the wand doesn't care. It just wants a new powerful master. Do you guys like our very official Harry Potter face cards? We made them ourselves using our printer. And Grindelwald is indeed a pretty good master until Dumbledore, the king himself, steps in. Now, of course, we have many theories about how this particular battle is going to go or not go for that matter. But as the story currently stands, this particular duel is the one that makes the least amount of sense as it pertains to the power of the Elder Wand. These two are so evenly matched that shouldn't the Elder Wand actually give the edge to Grindelwald? You'd think so, and yet he still loses. How is this possible if not for the Elder Wand's ability to recognize that Dumbledore is just a shade more powerful? But like, are, are you starting to see the paradox of this wand? In the end, it offers no extra power to the wielder other than confirming the fact that it is the most powerful master it's met so far. But that could doom you from the start if the wand is able to determine that your opponent is just naturally more powerful than you. It's just all so very clever because if you do in fact believe that death himself created this wand, you know that death's goal with the creation of the wand was to kill the first brother. And what does the legacy legacy and reputation of this wand do if not just constantly invite more death and furthering death's objectives. Anyway, we of course know that eventually Dumbledore does in fact duel Voldemort, who I would actually argue is also at king status. But because his soul is so badly ripped up, he doesn't quite have the edge over Dumbledore. He can still beat every other card, just not other kings, which there are already very few and far between of to begin with. Maybe when it comes down to it, he's like a queen point nine. But then something rather unexpected happens. Draco disarms Dumbledore. According to this theory, that shouldn't be possible. No offense to Draco or anything. I think through his years, he does prove to be a rather powerful wizard in his own right. But He's still not a king. In fact, I would argue that he is specifically a jack. Trelawney, in the prediction earlier in the book, describes the lightning struck tower and that the knave of spades, AKA the jack, would be involved. But 
here's the thing, Dumbledore isn't quite Dumbledore on that tower anymore. I mean, he's been living with the curse from the ring for almost a full year, which is basically the lifespan Snape gave him anyway. And he's still suffering from having drank the drink of despair and using all of the remaining energy to get Harry out of the cave alive and safe. So when Draco attacks Dumbledore on the tower, he is more powerful than Dumbledore. Of course, that doesn't really matter other than the fact that Dumbledore dies, which I guess does matter kind of a lot. But what I mean is Draco never uses the wand. Sure, he is, yes, the current owner, but only until Voldemort goes and steals it from Dumbledore's grave. Yeah, that's right. According to this theory, when Voldemort steals the wand from Dumbledore's grave, he is in fact the master of it. But he's almost the one who reveals this idea to us anyway. He's the one who recognizes this wand isn't doing anything extra for me. I do not understand. You have performed extraordinary magic with that wand. No, I have performed my usual magic. I am extraordinary, but this wand, no, it has not revealed the wonders it has promised. I would argue that only someone as powerful as Voldemort is might be even remotely capable of realizing the truth of this wand. It's only the people who have taken magic so far that can recognize that it's not taking you any further. But of course, he still comes to the wrong conclusion. He doesn't realize that the wand itself is a farce altogether. Instead, he just bulldozes forward with the belief that it is in fact the most powerful wand ever. He just needs to continue to tweak the circumstances, AKA kill Snape. The wand then of course meets Harry in the woods and would have in fact chosen him the ace except Harry doesn't fight. And as a result, the wand can't make Voldemort lose yet. In the Battle of Hogwarts, Voldemort is still more powerful than most of his opponents. But when push comes to shove and he finally faces down with Harry, the wand recognizes it's one final master, the ace. Voldemort loses and the war is over. Technically, at the end of the day, there are other reasons why Voldemort couldn't have actually won this duel, like because of blood magic and things like that, love. But I like this theory all the same because Harry does go on to use the Elder Wand in order to repair his old wand, which means that it does in fact have powers beyond the ordinary. It was just waiting on its one true master, the Ace, the master of death. Because after all, at the end of the day, the wand isn't the Ace in the hole. You are. Guys, for my question of the day, what do you think here? Is this the best explanation we've been able to come up with yet for how the path of the Elder Wand actually works? Be sure to leave your thoughts in the towel section down below. Also, because we had cards so heavily involved with today's video, which suit goes with which house? Do it in emoji form, it's more fun that way. But guys, as always, thanks for watching. Be sure to like this video if you haven't already and subscribe so you don't miss any future Harry Potter action from us. If you'd like to see our theory about how the Elder Wand possibly actually has a brother, be sure to check out this video right here. But otherwise guys, until next time, bye.